After a number of homeless men were attacked in their sleep on the streets of Las Vegas, the police were forced to devise some sort of plan to catch the budding serial killer they may have had on their hands. Before we move on, I'd like to give a shout out to PDS Debt for sponsoring this video. How many of you out there have been wishing that there was some better way to pay off debt? Maybe you're struggling with credit card debt, personal loans, debt collection agencies, or even medical bills. With inflation on the rise and gas prices at all-time highs, now is the time to get serious about a better plan to pay off your debt. If you're making your payments on your debt every month and the balances still aren't going down, then this is for you. PDS Debt is giving viewers of this channel a free debt savings analysis just for completing the 30-second online debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash diretrip. You'll get a full breakdown on how to save on interest each month and the quickest way to take care of your debt. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low 0% interest monthly payment. Everyone with over $10,000 or more in debt qualifies, and the cool thing is, there's no minimum credit score required. Fair and even bad credit is also accepted. You can end up saving thousands on interest and fees, and not to mention pay off your debt in a fraction of the time. PDS Debt is offering a free debt analysis to my listeners just for completing the quick and easy assessment at www.pdsdebt.com slash diretrip. That's pdsdebt.com slash diretrip. And now, back to the content. All across the United States, violent attacks on homeless people, namely those in their sleep, appeared to be increasing. This was causing more and more concern for advocates of the homeless. In the late 2010s, several fairly high-profile cases came to light. One example was back in 2014 when three teenagers out in Albuquerque beat two homeless men over the head with bricks and wooden sticks until they lost their lives. All three of those kids were charged with first-degree murder in the end. Another case was in 2015 when a homeless man was stabbed as he was sleeping in an alleyway in downtown Denver. Then, just a few years later, there was a spree out in Las Vegas in which three homeless men died or were attacked over a two-week period in a similar fashion, being bludgeoned in the head. On November 30th, 2016, a homeless man in Vegas was attacked in this manner, first alerting the police in the area. This man survived, luckily, but he never got a good look at his attacker. Despite this, he felt it wasn't anyone he knew. It seemed the attack was completely random, giving the cops very little leads to go on. A few months would come to pass, but, unfortunately, this would not be the last incident to catch them off guard. Daniel Aldape, originally from Chicago, was a 46-year-old homeless man who was living on the streets of Vegas. He was a big fan of Chicago sports, animals, and heavy metal music. He had been working for a radio station before losing his job, then started working at a Home Depot only to lose that job as well. Around the time of this incident, he was living in a homeless shelter, but unfortunately, he decided to live on the streets instead. Daniel lived on the hard streets of Vegas for about four months. During this time, he kept in touch with friends and family, calling them at least every other week or so to update them on how he was doing. In January of 2017, he was often sleeping near the intersection of Grand Central Parkway and City Parkway. This, apparently, was a very common area to find homeless people sleeping. One cold night on January 4th, a mysterious stranger would approach Daniel in his sleep, bashing him over the head with a blunt object, completely crushing his skull until he passed away. Given his loose contact with his family and his nomadic lifestyle, it was a full 20 days after his death before his family and friends even knew what happened. Just one month later, on February 3rd, the mysterious serial killer in the making would strike again, coming across Dave Dunn, a 60-year-old homeless man, as he slept very near to the same intersection in which Daniel was found. The police now were on full alert. The killings seemingly could not be pure coincidence. It was likely that they had a potential serial killer on their hands, and unless they did something, there was no reason to think that he would stop anytime soon. The cops would need to find some way to catch him, but realistically they couldn't stake out every homeless man in the city until something happened. In the end, no weapon was left behind, nothing was ever taken from the men, and most of all, there were no security cameras nearby to capture what had happened. They were going in pretty blind. One police officer, Captain Andrew Walsh, who was assigned to this case, came up with a very clever ruse in order to lure the killer in. Given that both of the men were attacked on the streets as they slept in a vacant lot near that one intersection, Walsh came up with a bold idea and decided to set up a trap for their suspect. 
The police created a human-looking decoy, acquiring a mannequin and dressing it in typical homeless garb. Captain Walsh brought in some old boots and one of his wife's blankets. He then got a knit cap, similar to what he saw other homeless men wearing, and studied how the homeless men in the area usually slept. This was all in order to position the dummy as accurately as possible. Then, they installed a hidden camera in the area and assigned some undercover cops to casually patrol the vicinity. Captain Walsh hoped that, above all, the plan would work quickly. It could be any time before the killer struck again. However, given how little leads they had, they had to completely bank on this plan working. The police would drive around with this mannequin for several days before they found the perfect spot to place him. The officers placed the dummy, which they named Charlie, at the intersection, made it look as believable as possible, and lied in wait. They didn't get any immediate results, and each morning they would pack Charlie back up and wait to set the plan up all over again. Homeless people all over the city were warned of the very real danger around this time, with Walsh saying, We had a sense of urgency. We didn't want these cases to fall by the wayside because they were homeless. We had to think of something that's not traditional. Luckily, many of the homeless people in the area took this advice to heart and, at the least, avoided the area in which the two men were killed. And then, after three weeks, their persistence finally paid off. It was February 22nd, 2017. The police watched as a suspicious man paced up and down a downtown street corner for almost 15 minutes straight, carrying a plastic bag. The man inched over to the dummy, carefully looking around to make sure nobody was watching. He then pulled a sledgehammer from his Little Caesars pizza bag and quickly slammed the dummy over the head. He did this again and again and again, gripping the handle with both hands, with the hammer violently bouncing off the dummy's head from the sheer force he was applying. Police were watching on video, aghast, as they saw their plan come to fruition. The man then stashed the hammer away and started leaving the scene, until the cops swarmed him. They confiscated his four-pound ball pin hammer and threw him into cuffs. Their suspect turned out to be a 30-year-old man named Shane Allen Schindler, from Bay City, Michigan. They had no reason to doubt that this was their killer, catching him red-handed in the act, trying to kill what he thought was yet another sleeping homeless man. The cops took him back to the station for a bit of interrogation. Shane didn't admit to attempting to kill anyone. He told the police that, in fact, he knew it was a mannequin all along. He told the police that he was walking along in the area and saw a dummy. He claimed that he knew it wasn't a real person because it wasn't either breathing or moving. Thinking it looked funny, he decided to kick it, he said, neglecting the fact that he was seen using a hammer in the attack. Right, right, yeah. Well, like I said, it was kind of weird, you know. Uh, well, yeah, that was kind of strange, a dummy sitting there, so... Okay. How sure of you were, were you that that was a dummy? 100%. 100%? Yes. You Before you made contact with it? Yes. Those are made to look like humans. Right. Well, like I said, it wasn't breathing, it wasn't moving. You know, I put stuff as ever sticking out. What if it was a human being that was just not moving? Well, you know, I was sure. Well, you're sure now. What, if, what I'm saying is, what if it turned out to be human? Would that have bothered you? Yeah, of course, but I knew it wasn't human. If it was human, I wouldn't have did it. He told the detectives that he was a homeless vagrant himself, usually sleeping in parking lots in a sleeping bag or with just a blanket. They didn't buy it, though, noticing that he was wearing perfectly pristine black sneakers and that his hands were meticulously clean. This man clearly didn't intend on telling the truth in any capacity. Shane was quickly booked into jail, but surprisingly he was released just a short while later. Not wanting to let their work go to waste, the police set up a team to watch over him and followed him out to the Henderson Hotel where he booked a room. Once he slipped out, they decided to search the room that he was staying in. Inside, they found a receipt for a hammer that he had just recently returned. Then, on his cell phone, they found some really damning evidence. Shane had multiple selfies on his phone. Two in particular, though, were interesting. Shane was seen lying on his back very near to where Dave and Daniel had been murdered. It appeared that he had returned to the scene of the crime and taken selfies as some sort of trophy, reveling in what he had done. Despite how blatantly obvious it was, based on circumstantial evidence that Shane was the killer, the police didn't really have any hard evidence to go off of. They never caught him attacking a real person, after all, and hitting a dummy with a hammer wasn't exactly going to result in a murder charge. 
The detectives scrounged together all they had, but they struggled to come up with any good evidence to pursue charges in the two killings and one attack months prior. They were left with no choice. They didn't have enough evidence to go to court, but Shane didn't know that. Hoping he was stupid enough to incriminate himself, they decided to strike up a deal with him. They wanted to know that, at the least, he didn't get away and that some kind of justice was served. The deal wasn't exactly perfect. If Shane agreed to this plea deal, he'd get anywhere from 8 to 20 years for attacking the mannequin, but he wouldn't face any charges in relation to the November attack or the murders of Daniel and Dave due to lack of evidence. But in the end, it seemed like this would be the best way to ensure that Shane was both punished and kept off the streets. Andrew Walsh spoke out about the deal, saying, This is good for the community, that he's taking this deal. He's off the streets. With this deal, they managed to avoid the inevitable argument in court over whether or not it was even possible to kill an inanimate object. But in most states, the law takes into account what the suspect was thinking at the time of the crime. Deborah Denno, a law professor at Fordham University, spoke out about the legal implications of an incident like this, saying that a criminal's thought process could have quite a bit of weight in a case like this. Most people would think you wouldn't get charged, she said. This teaches us that criminal law really focuses on what's going through someone's mind. That's what makes people dangerous and a threat to society. Shane Schindler was taken back into jail where he would remain until his sentencing. Shane's original public defender out in Clark County, a man named Phil Cohn, refused to comment on the case, aside from saying that the initial charge of attempted murder was a legal impossibility, arguing that you can't murder a mannequin. Deborah Denno agreed to an extent, commenting, You can't murder a mannequin, but if the facts were as he believed them to be, he would have been bashing the head of a human being. His next appointed defender, a woman named Ashley Sisolak, spoke out about the deal, saying that it was tough but fair, and also in the best interests of both Shane and the community. A judge of the peace ordered Shane to undergo a mental competency evaluation, not having the most confidence in his mental state. Shane stuck to his story, saying that he knew the dummy he attacked wasn't a real person from the very beginning. The chief deputy district attorney denied this claim, saying that there was no way Shane couldn't have known that he wasn't attacking a real human. The blanket was completely covering the dummy's head at the time of the crime, with Shane never lifting the blanket to check. They were able to slap some charges onto Shane at least. They were able to hit him with a felony charge of carrying a concealed weapon, his beloved pizza hammer. Bail was set at $50,000. His public defender said that he still intended to plead not guilty. While the competency exam was underway, the police had some time to go back and trace Shane's steps all over his hometown in order to get a better idea of what he had been up to. But much to their surprise, though, when Shane came to trial, he decided to plead guilty after all. Shane finally admitted that he thought the mannequin was a real person when he attacked it. Prosecutors then dropped the concealed weapon charge against him. Shane went back to jail to await his sentencing. Then, on August 24th, 2017, this case finally came to an end. Shane, who was set to get anywhere from 8 to 20 years, was sentenced to the maximum 20 years for what he had done. He remained silent and emotionless during the sentencing. While handing down the sentence, the district judge, Michael Villani, said, These attacks are senseless. It boggles the mind. Daniel Aldape's relatives, who were watching from the stands, were overjoyed to hear that Shane had gotten the maximum possible punishment. They hugged and cried outside the courtroom. Daniel's mother, Linda, spoke out, saying, People shouldn't have to worry about being murdered on the streets, but unfortunately it does happen. We're just glad this guy is behind bars. It's the only redeeming thing here. Fred Schalk, the man who raised him, added, He was a good person. He wasn't a fighter. He would never hurt anybody. He was good. Daniel was all set to participate in his sister's wedding that summer. Instead, a photo of him was included in the program. That day, a memorial was held for Daniel in which balloons were released into the sky, both in celebration of his life and of his killer being locked up. Once again, thank you for watching my video. If you found it interesting, please leave a like as it helps out with the algorithm and comment if you have something to say. Subscribe if you want to see more content like this as I post every week. If you don't mind, go ahead and follow me on social media, it's down in the description below, because if anything were to ever happen to this channel, that would probably be the only way you'd hear about it. And giving recent events, who knows. I also have a Patreon account which I keep down in the description below, where you can see videos early, ad-free, and uncensored. Speaking of which, shout out to the top patrons. We have George Lopez, 
Lee, aka Crust, Emilia Morales, Minnie Tina, Travis Billings, Lettuce, Jason Whitehurst, Lord Fool, Jim Dowell, Kimmy Leffel, Melina Lee Williams Haas, Motaz Hawk, Impalado, Stephen Jamie Kramer, Max Sword Guy, L, Rain Noir, Pao Yang, April Diamond, Starfade, Astral, Grack, Angie, Rick of Work in Progress USA, Sass Johnson, Marianne McCurdy, Buttery Frankus, Wafrans, Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Alan Damiani, Adrian Lawley, Marsh, Rinsenstein, Kim Peek, Lex Luthor, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Scoochie Maine, Jackie, and Mark Barnett. You are all super fantastically great. This has been your host, Kyle. Thank you, and good night.